fairy tales, myths, and legends. And this is kind of a big category of things. When you think about folk tales and fairy tales, those tend to be stories that are longer. They don't have the big single lesson that a fable has in it, but they also um, have a lot more story structure to them. They have beginnings, middles, and ends. They often have um, threes in them, the three little pigs, three billy goats gruff, three bears. They have re repetition. And so people that are listening to them know something happens once, it happens twice, it's going to happen a third time. Just like the sun rises, if things happen twice in a story, chances are they're going to happen a third time. And, and technically, a folk tale is a story that's told by folk, by people. Stories handed down from person to person throughout the, the years. Um, fairy tales are, are a subset of folk tales, and they tend to be stories that have some magic in them. So Cinderella would be a fairy tale because there's the fairy godmother. Um, Aladdin and the Lamp would be in that category of fairy tale because there's the genie. Um, so if there are genies or wizards or magic, then we put them in that fairy tale category. But in all fairy tales are folk tales, not all folk tales are fairy tales. Uh, myths and legends are a little bit different in that they tend to be stories that uh, define people's thoughts about society in them. Uh, when we think about myths nowadays, one of our general terms for a myth is something that isn't true. And, and that uh, definition came to us fairly late over the just the last few hundred years. But in a folklore sense, a myth is not a story that, that isn't true. A myth is a story that is so embedded in our culture that it happens over and over and over again. And so um, if you think of Greek and Roman and um, Scandinavian myths, talking about the, the Greek gods and, and the Scandinavian gods, those stories, if you look at what happened in those, those folk tales or those, those um, myths, um, tells you a lot about what cultures were like. You know, the stories about the, the Greek gods are very different from the, the Norwegian and Swedish Scandinavian gods. In Norway and Sweden, the Vikings fighting in battle and dying in combat was really important in their culture. And so you hear lots about battles in combat and fighting in those stories. Not nearly as common in stories from Greeks. The culture was very different. And so the stories tell us a lot about, about what, what societies believe. And also, these myths and legends also teach us a lot about what it means to be an adult. And a lot of times people talk about, you know, Western society today in the U.S. that that um, sometimes even adults um, aren't always acting as much as like adults as we'd like them to, and myths and legends often give us definitions of what it means to be an adult, and the hero stories often do that. If you think about hero tales like Beowulf um, or King Arthur, those stories almost always start with a teenage hero. King Arthur was a teenager, Beowulf was a teenager at the beginning of those stories, and those heroes face a crisis, and they have to fight their way through crises, usually sacrifice along the way. And at the end of those stories, those heroes are all fairly old men. Uh, in those days, old men would have been 50. Uh, but they're, they're older at, at the end of their lifetimes. And in every case, those uh, heroes go on to one last battle they know they're going to die in. And they still do it because it's the right thing to do. A long time ago, there was a wizard. And his name was Vaynermoinen. They say he made all of Finland. He could sing a song and mountains would spring from flat ground. He could sing a song and birds would appear in an empty sky. He could sing a song and trees would sprout from bare rock. Vaynermoinen had power. It was in his songs. Now once he'd made all of Finland, people say Vaynermoinen wanted to tell someone about it. The problem was he couldn't tell the animals. They were too busy finding food. He couldn't tell the humans, they were too busy making houses and planting crops. But he could tell Tuwani. See, Tuwani was a wizard almost as powerful as Vaynermoinen, but he had another name too. He was the Lord of the Dead. You see, he lived across the Dead River in a dark and desolate land. And every once in a while he came into our world, usually to cause trouble. One day Vaynermoinen was walking down the road when he met Tuwani said, hey Tuwani, what do you think of this beautiful land I've created? And Tuwani looked at it and said, yeah, it's okay. Okay? What do you mean okay? Have you ever seen beautiful birch trees that shine so much in the sun? Have you ever seen rivers so full of silvery fish? And Tuwani looked around with his one good eye and said, eh, it's okay. But uh, you know, later morning, uh, those deer you have there in the forest, this winter, they're going to eat all the trees. 
made our audience look at that for a little while and said, no, no, you're wrong, Tuani. Um, see, I make bear and snake to chase the deer out of the forests in the wintertime. Yeah, but don't bear and snake sleep in the wintertime, Vaynermoinen? The wizard hadn't thought of that. Well, you know, you're right, Tuani. Say, since you saw the problem, maybe you can see your way through to a solution. Could you make a creature to chase the deer out of the forests in the wintertime? Tuani thought about that for a minute and said, Well, sure, on one condition. What's that? Well, I need some of your magic to make it happen. See, my magic can only kill things. I need yours to bring them to life. What magic words can you give me to make a creature? And Vayner Morning thought for a minute and he said, All you gotta do once you've made your creature is whisper into its ear, up and devour the evil one. Say that and the creature will spring to life. Tawani smiled as he stomped away thinking, <laughs> We'll see who gets devoured this time, Vayner Morning. <laughs> He walked down to a village of the humans, went to a blacksmith shop, and got a handful of nails and stuffed them into his pockets. He got two glowing coals out of the fire and put them in the palm of his hand. He went to a carpenter shop and got a great big roof beam and put it over his shoulder. And he walked out into the woods and he found white rocks. And he stuffed them into a bag as well. He found gray moss and he gathered that up and took all these things across the dead river to a cave where he lived. He set that roof beam down like a backbone. He used those white stones for bones for four legs and a tail and a head. He used that gray moss for fur and flesh. He took those iron nails for teeth and claws and those two glowing coals for eyes. And when he'd made his gray creature, he bent over and whispered into its ear, up and devour Vader Moynihan. <laughs> Nothing happened. Did you hear me? Up and devour Vayner Moynihan. <laughs> Still nothing happened. Magic word Vayner Moynihan gave me didn't even work. I'm going to go talk to that wizard. And he grabbed his creature and stomped off to Vayner Moynihan's house and pounded on the door. Vayner Moynihan, get out here. I want to talk to you. And when the old, old wizard opened the door, he saw Tuani standing there and a gray furry creature lying on the ground behind him. Tuani, it's not the creature you made. It, it looks very scary. Uh, uh, Tuani, it's not moving. Of course it's not moving, Vayner Moynihan. The magic you gave me didn't even work. I want another magic word. It didn't work? You know, Tuani, maybe it's how you're saying the words. You know, how you say something is just as important as what you're saying. Let me hear how you pronounce the words. Now, Tuani did not want to show Vayner and what he'd been saying, so he bent very close to the creature's ear and whispered as quietly as he could, Up and devour Vayner Moynihan! <laughs> Nothing happened. Now, even though people say Vayner Moynihan was old on the day he was born, he had really sharp hearing. And he heard what Tuani was saying, and he knew what to do. You know... Tuani, you're mispronouncing the last part of that sentence. It should really be up and devour the evil one. Bring! The creature began to move and it looked around. It looked over at Tuani and over at Vayner Moynihan and back at Tuani and a growl rumbled like thunder from its throat. And Tuani began backing away from the house. Well, well I, I see that the creature's moving now. I guess my job is done. I'll see you later, Vayner Moynihan. Bye! And he took off running for the woods, and the creature was chasing right behind him, growling and snapping at the heels of his leather boots. Vayner Moynihan called after him, Tuani, what do you call this creature that you made? But all Vayner Moynihan heard was the words, Stop! Wolf! Stop! Wolf! Stop! Wolf! Now, we thought the creature's name probably wasn't Stop. So it must be called Wolf. That's what we call them to this very day. And the grandmothers in Finland, they still tell their children, if you hear a wolf howling in the forest, don't worry. It's only doing its job, chasing deer out of the forests in the wintertime, so the deer don't eat all the trees. 
But even if it's not doing that job, it's doing its other job. Chasing Tuwani, the evil one, keeping him moving all the time. So he can't cause too much trouble in any one place. And someday, someday, they might just catch him. And that's the end of the story. Now that story involves sort of a folk and fairy tale kind of story. Um, mythic stories often involve gods and goddesses, and sometimes heroes as well. A long time ago, there was a satyr, and a satyr is one of those creatures with, with goat-like body from the waist down, and a human body from the waist up, and two little horns. And this satyr, well, he'd been drinking a little bit, and he fell asleep in the rose garden of King Midas. And King Midas knew right away that this satyr was a good friend of Dionysus, the god of wine. He figured, this guy's got connections, I better take care of him. So he had his servants carry the satyr to a beautiful room and set him in a bed and gave him everything he needed, food and water and wine. And after a few days, the satyr was feeling a little bit better and went off looking for his friend, the god Dionysus. And Dionysus was so pleased with the care that had been given to his friend that he told King Midas, let me give you a gift. What do you want? I'll give you one wish, anything you want. And Dionysus thought for a minute and he said, ah, gold. I love nothing more than gold. I want anything I touch to turn to gold. Dionysus looked at him and said, are, are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I love gold. Okay. Dionysus stretched out his left hand and touched the man on the tip of his fingers, and poof, the god was gone. Midas began running all over his castle, touching everything he could find, and sure enough, plates and tables and pillars and doors all turned to solid gold. Now, it made those doors kind of heavy to open and close, but he was so happy, he spent the whole rest of the day touching everything in his castle. And when it was time to eat, of course, he sat down and he realized the curse he had asked for. Because when he lifted a, a golden goblet to his lips and his lips touched that wine, poof, it turned to gold. And the grapes he picked up, they turned to gold too. And he suddenly realized that he couldn't eat anything without turning it to gold. And that would be bad enough. But about that same time, his daughter came running into the room. Father, father, I just found the most beautiful butterflies out in the garden. Come quick, I want to show them to you. And she grabbed onto her father's hand and turned into a golden statue. And then Midas knew that he had to do something. Putting on a regular workman's clothes, he began wandering around through the countryside looking for Dionysus. And it took weeks for him to find the god sitting in a field, singing and dancing with the satyrs and the fawns. He went up to the god and said, Dionysus, you were right. I, I, I don't want to be able to turn everything I touch into gold. Please take this away. And the god smiled and said, I can't. You asked for it. I can't take it away. But you can. There's a river not far from here. Follow the river all the way up into the mountains. And when you get to the spring that's the start of that river, wash yourself in that water, and it'll take away the magic. Take a picture of that water home with you and dump it on everything that you turn to gold, and it'll turn back the way it was. And from now on, Midas, be careful what you wish for. And Midas took those words to heart, washed himself in that spring, and to this day, if you go up into the mountains in Greece, you can find that spring, there are little flecks of gold in the ground all around that spring. And he took that picture of water, and the first person, of course, he poured it on was his daughter. And he realized then what true wealth is. And that's the end of the story. So any questions about, about folk tales, fairy tales, myths, and legends as a group? This is often the category people think about when you think about storytelling. These are the ones that often end up in picture books and those sorts of things.